stand before him and ask him to help me. Welcome, everybody, to Calvary Chapel of Hope. Those here, uh, we welcome those listening online at YouTube and those listening on the radio at WGSS 89.3 FM. Uh, we don't have any uh, worship music this morning, so we will worship the Lord with our minds and our hearts as we get into the Word. Uh, we're going to be in Exodus 28, so if you want to start turning there, and then we will pray. Father, I want to come before you tonight and ask for your grace. We come, Lord, as your children in Christ through faith. Uh, we ask that by your spirit, you'd use men, me tonight, Lord, but it's men throughout the world in your church that you use to help teach our brethren. I pray, Lord, you'd use me in that capacity tonight. I pray for those who listen, uh, that you'd be speaking to their hearts. You'd be speaking to my heart. Uh, you would give us more reason to, to adore you and praise you and that our understanding would encompass more of what you want us to see in your word. I pray you'd bless us tonight. Ask for Pastor Claude and his continued healing, Lord. Thank you that he's feeling better today, but we pray that that work would be finished in his body. He'd be well. Uh, and all those, Lord, in our congregation particularly who might be suffering with illness or pain, uh, lift them up tonight to you, Lord. I ask that you would heal them. You'd be with them, reminding them that you work all things for the good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So we lift up tonight. We pray, help us to understand your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys. So we're going to be in Exodus 28, and then we're going to, a little bit later, jump into the book of Leviticus for a short period of time. Sometimes people hear about the book of uh, Leviticus, and they get somewhat intimidated because they say either I've never read the book of Leviticus because I started it, and I realized I had no idea what it was talking about. Or they get through it, and they realize by the end of it, I have no idea what it was talking about. So uh, it's not too often outside of Calvary Chapel churches, I think, that you hear too many messages uh, in the book of Leviticus or really having much to do with it. Just maybe some things here or there. Tonight we're going to read through an entire chapter uh, in the hopes that we can see something about Jesus tonight in the book of Leviticus and in the book of Exodus. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 28 in Exodus, and what we're going to be going through is the exciting topic of Aaron and his clothes. I know you came tonight expecting to hear about wardrobe, uh, and as mundane as that might sound, uh, as we read it, I'm hoping we can see why God instructed Moses the way that he did to design the clothing that he wanted Aaron to wear as he served in the function he was going to give him as the high priest of the nation. And I think we're going to see something, uh, hopefully, that'll help us to appreciate more of what God does in his genius in the past as he points forward, uh, and more about what Jesus has done for us. Uh, in the book of Colossians, before we start, it says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival, a new moon, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. And that concept is something we're going to utilize tonight. You know, when it talks about foods and festivals and new moons and Sabbaths, it's uh, Paul talking about Old Testament laws and ceremonies. And he says, these days as believers, we don't need to be judged in whether or not we keep those things uh, or perform those things. That's not what we're judged by. We're judged by our faith in Christ. But he does point out that these things are a shadow. They were a shadow of things to come. 
but the substance, and that word substance means the thing that casts the shadow is Jesus. What we're going to look at tonight are some of the shadows. We're going to look, and when you look at a shadow, I don't know if maybe some of you can see my shadow, it looks something like me. It's got my general shape. You could acquire some details about me by looking at my shadow, but you won't know the fullness. You won't know my facial expression. You won't know the color of my skin. You won't know any of these fine, intricate details because it's just a shadow. And that's what we'll see as we look at clothing. It's a shadow of something. There's a, a form to it. It's got something to say to us, but it's, it's not the full thing. It's not the entire picture. But there is something to it. In first, uh, first, uh, Second Peter chapter 1, it says, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, or we have the more sure prophetic words, another way to translate that, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And you think about what Peter is drawing. He's talking about all the prophecies of the Old Testament, all those shadows. He says they're like a light. And they're good for us. That It's good for us to have light. He says they're like a light that shines in a dark place. And if you know anything about lighting back in these days, it was almost like a little oil lamp, something like a candle. And he says these prophecies, these Old Testament types and shadows are like little lights in dark places. Light is good. And he says we should use that light until the, the sun comes out, right? This little light that has a short distance it can cast and it can lighten and it can give you some information, help you to see things, is good until the great light appears, until your eyes can see everything because all is open to you. So he says until the sun rises and the morning star rises in your hearts, right? The, the fuller revelation of who Jesus is. When that starts to shine, you'll realize the candles aren't really what you pay attention to that much. Uh, but until then, Right, until we see Jesus face to face, there is value in looking at the, the little lights, looking at the shadows. And that's what we're going to do. So let's get to it. <clears throat> Chapter 28, verse 1. <clears throat> it says, now take Aaron, your brother. It's talking to Moses, God's talking to Moses on Mount Sinai here. Take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, who, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as a priest. And we see first and foremost, God is calling. This is the first time that Aaron finds out that he's going to be used as a priest, uh, before God. And this is Moses getting this information for the first time, and God's telling him specifically, I want you to call Aaron and Aaron's sons. They are going to be priests to me. One of the things uh, people have trouble conceptualizing is the difference between a Levite and a priest. Aaron and Moses were Levites. Levi is one of Jacob's 12 sons. If you remember Abraham, he had his son Isaac. Isaac had his son Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons, one of which was Levi. From Levi, he had kids. Uh, what are some of their names? Merari is one of them. There's a couple. There's, there's a, several of them. Uh, Moses and Aaron are descended from their kids. I think Levi is their grandfather or great-grandfather. And then Aaron's going to have kids. The Levites are going to be given a special place in Israel. So all of Levi's descendants are not going to be able to own land. The Lord is going to provide for them and be their portion. And it'll be their job to do certain services around the temple carrying the ark, uh, for instance, or uh, setting up the boards of the tabernacle. They're going to have certain tests that they can do, but God does narrow it down a little bit more. And he says certain descendants of Levi, specifically Aaron's descendants, will be those who are priests. Now, a priest is somebody who is allowed to uh, participate and make the offerings and the sacrifices. Only Aaron and his kids were going to do that. So that was their special task that they're being given. So all the priests were Levites, but not every Levite was a priest. Does that make sense? Good. Uh, so Aaron's finding out he's going to be a priest. Moses is getting this information and something God tells him. And this is so interesting, right? He says, he's, he's, the first thing he talks about is Aaron's clothes. He goes, listen, get Aaron, get his sons. We got to make them clothes. 
Right? Says, we're going to make him garments. And the first thing he says is, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. So this is specifically talking about Aaron's clothes. Aaron's going to be what's known as the high priest. Then there are going to be other priests, his sons, who will do you know, some offerings. But Aaron's going to have a special task, which we'll get to in Leviticus. But we're going to talk first about Aaron's specific clothes, which are going to be made to give him glory and to give him beauty. These things he's going to wear, and we'll see some pictures of it because I think pictures help uh, understand this topic a little more. They're going to make Aaron distinct among all the people. Nobody in Israel is going to look like Aaron looks. Not even the other priests are going to look like Aaron looks. Aaron will be the one person, the only guy, who looks that glorious and that beautiful. And this is going to be part of what those clothes are going to do for him. Bring him glory and beauty. The next thing you see after that, it says, So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, and they shall make Aaron's garments. So uh, some people who are going to be given special wisdom and talent and ability to be tailors. They're going to sew all of this stuff together, and they're going to be really good at it. This stuff is an artistic rendition that somebody reading through the Bible you know, drew based on what they could imagine. But these people were specifically gifted by God for this task. I'm going to assume that our artist here can't really fathom how beautiful the work is that they did. There are some pieces of art you look at, and you are amazed somebody was able to do that. You know, there are some things people knit together, and you say, how does anybody have the ability to do things like that? So I think in this case, that's an artist's idea of how beautiful the things might have been. But I think in reality, they probably were much more beautiful than that. Verse 4, oh no, there's still in verse 3, it says, Whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as priest. These garments were going to set Aaron apart. That's what the word consecrate means. It literally means to be forfeit to the sanctuary. So in essence, when Aaron puts these clothes on, he is going to be for the distinct function of being a high priest. He's not going to be Aaron, your friend, or Moses, his brother. He's not going to be in any of those capacities when he's wearing these clothes. These clothes are going to make him something he's not, something special. Once he puts them on, they're going to set him apart for the purposes of God and of the sanctuary. Uh, verse 4 says, And these garments, uh, and these are the garments which they shall make. So here we get our items. And I'll kind of point out what they are in that picture in a second. Uh, they shall make a breastplate an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. So they shall make, so they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, uh, that he may minister to me as priest. And we'll see. He'll describe what Aaron's sons had to wear as well. But let's kind of look at this picture, and I'll try to break it down. The one on the left, I think, is a little bit easier to see what's going on. So the first piece mentioned here is the breastplate. You see that square with all what looks like stones in it? sitting on top of the very colorful piece of fabric that looks kind of like an apron. The little square section is the breastplate. Now, it's not a piece of armor. It was really just, uh, the, the Hebrew word re means like breast pouch. It was like a sack. Picture my piece of paper like this. Fold it up in half so that it has a little pouch in it and put it on my chest. This is the breastplate, and it's kind of clipped onto my shoulders and then clipped down to, to a belt I had on the bottom. In here, they would keep something. We'll read about that in a second. But this is what it is. It would be a square instead of a rectangle. I just don't have a long enough piece of paper. But that's what that is, the breastplate. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Karen. That's the breastplate. We'll read about the description of the breastplate in a second. If you can go back to that first picture, the next thing he says is an ephod. Ephod is what the breastplate is sitting on top of. It's that very ornate, colorful, looks like an apron or a vest. That's an ephod. We'll talk about more what that is in a second. A robe goes underneath your ephod. That's the blue part. He's got the blue sleeves, the, the lengthy blue, what we would call almost like a gown with the, the bells at the bottom and these little ornate things down there. And underneath that is a regular old white tunic. Tunics were worn by just about everybody back in these days. They're just long garments. They have long sleeves. They go down to your feet. Oftentimes, they'd be tied around with a long piece of fabric called a sash, and that would dangle down by your feet as well. What men would do back in those days if you had to work is you would take your sash that's dangling down by your feet, you'd pull it up between your legs, and you'd tie it into your belt, and now you have, you have shorts on. 
That's called girding up your loins. <laughs> so if you ever read in the Bible where it says, gird up the loins of your mind, right? This is the ideas. Take the things that are getting in the way that if you're working might trip you up and put them in their proper place so they're out of your way. Gird up the loins of your mind. Uh, men often would do that when they were working out in the field. The turban is the little hat on his head. And now we have the general idea of what these pieces look like. Now we'll talk about their construction. <clears throat> Verse 5 says, They shall take the gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and the, uh, and the fine linen, and they shall make the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, artistically worked. This ephod, first thing we're going to get the details of are the colors of the fabric. Gold, blue, purple, scarlet, or red, right? Now, gold wasn't gold fabric. It was real gold. They used to have a, a method of stripping gold and turning it into very, very fine, uh, almost like thread. And they would weave it into the fabric. Now, you might wonder why these colors. I don't know if you're me. I wonder why these colors. And maybe I'll disappoint you. I'm not planning to get into what does blue represent, right, or what does purple represent. I know there are a lot of people who do, so maybe you'd be edified to listen to those. Some people would, I think, speculate, right, purple is royalty, and, and you know, blue is this, and red is that, the blood of Christ. I get it, and it, there's a good chance there's great significance to those things. I have a simpler point to make. These colors, purple, besides the gold, purple, red, and scarlet, were also colors God directed to be used somewhere else. If you Read just before chapter 28, Moses receives the construction of the tabernacle. And the tabernacle, which was going to be the meeting place where God's presence would dwell among the people. It was where the Ark of the Covenant would go and rest inside of the Holy of Holies. And nobody could go in there except we'll find out the high priest one time a year. Now the gate, the curtain, it was all made of fabric and wood. The curtain to get into the first area was made of linen. Red, purple, and blue. As you go deeper in, the next curtain, red, purple, and blue fabric. When you get inside, there's cherubim, and the, which are like little angelic kinds of beings. I don't know what they look like. You read Revelations. They're kind of like beasts and monsters. They're creatures. But they were told to, uh, above the ceiling in the fabric, in blue, purple, scarlet, make images of cherubs and all of these things, and it's to represent what it looks like in heaven. This is a heavenly scene in the tabernacle on earth given in representation. And as you go deeper into the holiest of all, more red, purple, scarlet, and you see these things. Aaron, as he's wearing this robe, he would come out. Imagine he puts it on, and you're sitting there, and you're looking at Aaron. You're looking at the tabernacle. The first thing you would think is, wow, he looks like he's from there. <laughs> Aaron and the tabernacle match. It would almost be like Aaron's more of a representative from the tabernacle than he is from us. But here he is as a man wearing the tabernacle on himself. And maybe there's some verses popping into your head as we talk about this where it says, uh, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us or tabernacled among us, talking about how Jesus came from heaven and he was with us. The same way Aaron looked like a representative of this heavenly place he was a represent he looked like heaven itself he fit in there well that's exactly where jesus fit in that's where he was from jesus came from heaven to the earth and he truly was a representative of heaven's temple heaven's tabernacle where god truly dwells and here we see aaron now imagine he doesn't just have the blue the purple the red he's also got this gold all the way weaved through intricately with beautiful designs. Imagine seeing Aaron as he's doing his thing at the altar and you catch a glimpse of him on a sunny day. What does he look like? He's shining. He's glimmering. He's, he's, he looks majestic right, for glory and for beauty. Gold, oftentimes in the Bible, if you look at how the tabernacle is built, how the furniture is built, everything's overlaid with gold or bronze and when things are overlaid with gold, they signify something divine, right? something pure and holy. And here's Aaron ministering as the high priest with this beautiful glory on. And he's shining like this divine person, shimmering in the sun, the light emanating from his body. And you would see him doing what he's doing with the animals and going and sprinkling blood. And God's trying to say something 
to us about Aaron. And remember, the clothes are what's making Aaron different. It's not Aaron himself. We know Aaron's not perfect. Aaron was a man like the rest of us. Aaron was not sinless. Aaron, shortly after Moses gets these instructions, is going to make a golden calf for people to worship and lead them into idolatry. Uh, Aaron, at one point in his life, is going to think he's better than his brother Moses, and he's going to have pride in his heart and think he should be the one leading the people, and God's going to uh, have a lot to say about that to him and his sister. Uh, so Aaron was not a perfect person that he got this position, that he could be the high priest. These clothes, these garments, we'll see God is saying, these put you into a certain position for a reason, which we'll keep getting into. Oh, well, excuse me. Let's continue. <laughs> uh, let's see, where do we leave off here? Let's go verse 9. It says, then you shall take two onyx stones. You can go to that uh, picture there, Karen. I think it's the next one. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and six names on the other stone, in order of their birth, with the work of an engraver uh, in stone, like the engravings of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in settings of gold, and you shall put, uh, put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. So Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. You shall also make settings of gold, and you shall make two chains of pure gold like braided cords, and fasten the braided chains to the settings. So the next piece of our high priestly garment that is mentioned are these two shoulder settings. And he says to take two stones, onyx stones are black, and in each one you're going to engrave the names of all the 12 sons of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob, right? Uh, six on each shoulder. And I, I was sitting there thinking, you know, it says in the work of a, like a signet. And I was thinking, are there, is there really any other way? And there truly is. If you think about it, two ways to engrave things. You can make something like a stamp, a stamp chisels things away and leaves what remains to leave the mark. Something like a signet digs into something else. And when you push down on like a piece of wax, it fills the space that got dug in and leaves its signal. So there are two different ways. He says specifically, I don't want you to carve away at the stone or at the rock so that way you can leave what remains as the names of Israel. Instead, I want you to leave the rock and I want you to scar it and mar it with the names of the children of Israel. And you can, once again, maybe your imagination sitting there going like, oh, it's like, we sing songs about that, right? My names are engraven upon his hands. and It's not that what we see is us. What we see is us carved into him. We took out of him, right, out of Jesus. And we see that these two stones were going to be on the shoulders of the high priest. In his function, the high priest was doing sacrifices, offerings, but it was also his responsibility to lead the people and to enforce the covenant of God. It was up to him as the primary figure and the other priests under him to lead the people in what it meant to know God and what it meant to live righteously and justly according to the covenant standards that God had established. Uh, he was the main teacher of these things. Uh, and we see it's, he's got all of the nation upon his shoulders as he goes in before God to do what he does as priest. He bears them, and it says as a memorial before God that this is my function and my role. And there's a good verse. I thought of it, Isaiah 9, 6, where it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, right? And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, everlasting father or father of everlasting and prince of peace. And we see that Aaron, when he puts on these clothes and he, he's becoming something he's not, right? He's putting these things on and one of the things he's going to be doing is bearing the weight of his brethren upon his own shoulders. Uh, the whole nation is going to ride upon him. Let's go to verse 15. It says, you shall make the breastplate of judgment artistically woven according to the worksmanship of the ephod. So it's going to look like the ephod in its fabric. <clears throat> of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen you shall make it. It shall be doubled into a square, like I said with that little pouch mechanism. A span shall be its length, and a span shall be its width. A span is the length from the tip of your thumb to the tip of your pinky. <clears throat> and you shall 
uh, put settings of stone in it, four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and an emerald. This shall be the first row. The second row shall be a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, uh, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold settings. And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, each one according to its own name. They shall be according to the twelve, uh, the twelve tribes. You shall make the chains for the breastplate at the end, like braided cords of pure gold. And you shall make two rings of gold for the breastplate and put two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. Then you shall put the two braided chains of gold in the two rings, which are at the ends of the breastplate, and at the two ends, uh, and the other two ends of the two braided chains you shall fasten to the two settings. Sorry, guys. And put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in front. I'm going to read through this because it's just telling us how it's connected, okay? So we're going to read all this for me just to say that at the end. You shall make two rings of gold and put them on the two ends of the breastplate on the edge of it which is on the inner side of the ephod. And two other rings of gold you shall make and put them on the two shoulder straps underneath the ephod toward its front, right at the seam above the intricately woven band or belt of the ephod. Uh, they shall bind the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings of the ephod using a blue cord so that it is above the intricately woven band of the ephod and so that the breastplate does not come loose from the ephod. This was the whole point of what we just read is, guys, I'm going to tell you how to connect it. <laughs> The, the breastplate is going to sit on top of the beautiful robe or the beautiful vest, right? the beautiful ephod. On the ephod shoulders, you have the two straps, and now connected to those straps are going to be this little pouch with these 12 stones on it. And you're going to take the chains, you're going to clip them to your shoulders, then you're going to take another two chains at the bottom and clip them around the, to the belt. The ephod would have had its own little sash. Uh, and this is how it's going to stay there. So that way, as you're over there ministering and bending over and doing your thing, it doesn't like flap around or fall off of you. Let's keep reading verse 29. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. How beautiful is that? Right? Aaron has this breastplate, and it's called the breastplate of judgment, or the breastplate. Judgment means distinction or decision or justice. And here's Aaron over his own heart, and this is as a memorial to the Lord. Now, do I think Aaron, as every day he's putting this on, he's sitting there dwelling upon what all of this could mean? I don't know if he's doing that, but the Lord knows what he set it up to mean. And here's Aaron in this almost divine reenactment. Aaron's almost like an actor. And God's giving him his part to play. And God knows what the play is about. He knows what Aaron looks like. Aaron does. And Aaron thinks, I just have to do these things. I have to put this on. I'm the high priest. I have to do these functions. But to the Lord, it's, a, it's testifying of something to him. And here's Aaron with the names of all of his brethren upon his heart as he goes in to minister before the Lord. Their judgment, their justice is tantamount to what he feels for. And he wears it as he carries them around on his shoulders. He wears them upon his heart as he goes and does what a high priest has to do. And you can see, again, maybe you're already picturing what this is supposed to be telling us about Jesus. Uh, that's, we'll find out Jesus' function today is he's our high priest. Uh, and like Aaron, who wears the names of his brethren upon his heart, I truly think Jesus bears our names upon his. Right? And it's not just that our names are there. It's in the breastplate of judgment, right? Jesus, with us in mind, went before uh, the cross. He went and bore judgment and, and allowed justice to be served on our behalf, right? Because that's where we were. It says, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, right? Despising the shame. But he did it because he had something in mind. I, I doubt that it was, you know, actually, I don't doubt, I know it wasn't the angels he had in mind. It says so in Hebrews. It was us. We are who he had in mind when he bore the cross. And here's Aaron, again, just this man, this sinful man, who's putting on these garments that are making him something he's not, and one of the things he has to do is bear the names of the nation upon his shoulder, have them upon his heart, and go and do these things for justice and judgment. And this is what he's doing. Like I said, did Aaron catch the whole point? I, I doubt it. 
but it was pointing forward. It's a shadow. Remember, Aaron is just casting a shadow. You're not supposed to look at Aaron and go, oh, there it is. That's a God-loved high priest and the priest and the ephod and all that. It's a shadow. What's, what's casting the shadow? <laughs> and so we're supposed to follow the shadow up and go, oh, I see some feet and, oh, I see a waist and, oh, I see a face. Who is it? It's, it's Jesus. Let's keep going. Uh, it says, verse 30, And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. And I know some of you right now are going, Urim and Thummim, or Urim and Thummim. Yes. Now we're going to move on. I don't really have too much to say about those. Uh, unfortunately, those two things are kind of mysterious. We don't know too much about them outside of they were some sort of object that went in the breastplate pouch. Uh, literally, the translation means lights and perfections right? or light and truth. Uh, what some rabbinic scholars would say is that they were maybe a dark stone and a light stone. Uh, and in some way, when the priest went in before the Lord to find out what was going to be just or right in his eyes, he would use these things in some way to discern what the will of the Lord was. Uh, you see it mentioned later in the Bible how these things, you would go before the Lord with the um, uh, Urim and the Thummim, and you would find out what his will was. You don't hear about it in the Bible after David. They somehow fell out of mention or out of use. But here we do say they were a part of this high priestly garment. Within his heart, he bears the children of Israel upon it, and within, light and truth. Right? Light and perfection are what the breastplate of judgment is based upon. Uh, you can do what you want with that. I don't have too much to do with it. But <laughs> Verse 31. He says, you shall make the robe of the ephod of all blue. So we're on to the next piece of the garment, right? This robe. This is underneath the ephod. Uh, there shall be an opening... Uh, for his head in the middle of it, it shall have a woven binding all around its openings. That's around the neck. It's one piece of fabric. Picture like a, a, a rectangle with a hole. And the hole, so that it doesn't rip, they sew a bunch of bindings around it. So it's kind of a reinforced neckline. You would take that and you'd put it over yourself. Uh, some people think it had sleeves. Some people don't think so. I don't know. Could, it couldn't. I know the pictures from the beginning. They show blue sleeves. Maybe. Right, we leave it to that. But it's a piece of fabric under the ephod. I like the opening of a coat of mail so that it does not tear. Verse 33. <clears throat> and upon its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet all around its hem, and bells of gold between them all around, a gold bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate, upon the hem of the robe all around. And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers, uh, and its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out that he may not die. Uh, this is an interesting little section. We'll touch upon it a little more in depth uh, in a little bit, but this is a good picture in case you're having trouble imagining. Like, uh, Karen, go back uh, one, two pictures maybe. That's a pomegranate for those who don't know what those look like. Now you can see why... In the other picture, there are little balls with some thread hanging down. That's what a real pomegranate looks like. And this is what the inside of a pomegranate looks like. Maybe some of you enjoy those. I tried them for a while. You know, you kind of take all those seeds and they burst into like juice in your mouth. It's like adult gushers, but I prefer the kid version. <laughs> but anyway, you might be wondering, like, what's the deal with these bells and these pomegranates? This was the main function of the robe. It was going to have these little noisemakers on the bottom. And it said Aaron had to wear this. It was not optional. You can't just say, ah, it's a hot day. I'm going to just rock with the ephod today and just go with that. It's, you, Aaron would go into the temple and God would strike him dead. Uh, and don't think God wouldn't. He kills two of Aaron's sons in Leviticus chapter 10 because they pretty much did that. They went in and tried to do things their own way with some strange incense and God burned them alive. So God doesn't play around. He's not taking lightly what he's preaching to them through these symbols, okay? So this blue ephod had to be worn for the specific reason of those little bells. And uh, we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll chat. It says that if those bells aren't jingling when he goes in there, then Aaron's going to die. That's what's going to happen to him. It's very plain, very clear. Uh, 
Where is it here? And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers, and its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, that he may not die. Now, it's not because he's going to startle God somehow, or, you know, if I sneak in there, and God's going to wake up and then smite me. No, of course not. God knows all things, and he never slumbers, right? So that's not the reason. Uh, and it's not because God just likes the sound of bells, okay? Don't, there are some people who I think read this, and then they think, like, oh, it's like heavenly chimes, and... No, I don't think so. It means Aaron's wearing the garments. <laughs> That's what it means. When this sound is being made, picture Aaron goes into the curtain. You as a person on the outside making a sacrifice to God, you gave your animal, they slaughtered it. Well, you slaughtered it. They took its blood and they're sprinkling the blood. And Aaron's in there and you don't see what's going on. The curtains are closed. But you hear jingle, 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 jingle. And what you know is somebody is making intercession for me. Right? There's some, it's a testimony to you that somebody is in there doing the work of a high priest. Somebody's interceding and mediating on my behalf between me and God. And for God, on God's side, it means the right person, somebody who's adorned to do the work, is doing the work. Right? It's not any other guy. It's Aaron. He's jingle jangle, and with his ephod of glory and beauty, and he's shining in the sun, this is, this is who it is. So that's what it represents. And that picture must be uh, portrayed or Aaron is not doing his job. And Aaron, like I said, he'll die. Verse 36 says, you shall also make, oh, one more thing about the pomegranates that I found interesting. When you look at uh, the previous picture, I was wondering, you know, why pomegranates? What's so special? God's very particular. It's like, you know, a pomegranate, a bell, a pomegranate, a bell. And these things are hanging down from Aaron. Now picture... Well, the picture previous to this, what the pomegranates hang off of? A vine, a branch, <laughs> right? Aaron, as he's walking around, looks like a fruit tree. He looks like a, a pomegranate plant, right? He's walking around and he's got these fruits dangling off of the hem of his garment. And what, did, what was one of Jesus' ways of describing himself? I'm the vine, you're the branches. You're going to produce fruit, Right? Some will produce 100-fold, some 60, some 30. Uh, so you see, it's almost like Aaron in this, when he puts these clothes on, it's like he's a tree producing fruit from the tree, right? And then inside of a pomegranate, for some reason, this is one of those peculiar kinds of plants, inside of a pomegranate's flesh or its body, there are so many seeds. Fruit has seeds, but not that many seeds. And you see that many little pieces make up this one body of pomegranate. And I think, again, this is a testimony to what would take place in Christ, that his body is made up of many members, right? And in him, we are one in him, right? And then he's going to produce fruit through us. Uh, anyway, that's my little take on pomegranates. Take it or leave it. That's what I, uh, I thought was interesting. Verse 36, you shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And you shall put it on a blue cord, that it may be on the turban. It shall be on the front of the turban. Uh, so it shall be on Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall always be on his forehead, uh, that they may be accepted before the Lord. This is an interesting portion. Right? We move up to the next piece of his garment, which is his hat. And he's got this white turban on, but on the turban, they have this gold plate. And on the plate, it's carved in there, holiness to the Lord. And he wears it upon his head, and he ties it with a blue cord so it doesn't fall off his head. You know, whether he ties it around or he ties it over, I don't know. But either way, it's strapped to his head, holiness to the Lord. And the Lord sees this, and it says that he has to wear this to bear the iniquity of the holy things that the children of Israel were worshiping him with. Isn't that interesting? That in some way, in some capacity, all of these things had shortcoming in them. Right? The bulls, the rams, the goats, the, ta the tabernacle itself, Aaron as a man. These things, although being used in a holy manner and in, in the worship God is prescribing, God says that they themselves bear iniquity in them. There's something not perfect about them. And says, Aaron's going to put this, this hat on, and God's going to see the hat, and it's going to say, holiness to the Lord, and that is going to bear the weakness of all those things. 
right? As Aaron's standing there, you picture what God's looking at as he's looking at Aaron. This man set apart because of what he's wearing. He's representing something he's not. Aaron is not holiness to the Lord. Aaron's wearing holiness to the Lord. Right? He's dressed up as holiness to the Lord. But he himself isn't that. But God's looking at him, reading that headband, and God knows who is holiness to the Lord, who is the Holy One of Israel. Uh, and it's his son. He's looking at Aaron, and he knows exactly what's going to take place in the future. Uh, and Aaron's representing that. And because he's representing that, all the weakness in those things is able to be born. Right? That they, there's a time when their weakness will be put away for the reality, where it won't just be the shadow, it'll be the shadow caster. I don't know if that's a Michael Jackson song. It might be. Let's keep going. Verse 39, you shall skillfully weave the tunic. We're on to the next piece, the underlying fabric, right? The, the lowest part of his garment. You shall skillfully weave the tunic of fine linen thread. You shall make the turban of fine linen, and you shall make the sash of woven work. Uh, and then, So that's the last part of Aaron's garments, this pure, white, plain tunic. And it sits underneath everything, right? You can go, that's what it looks like. Go back to the first picture. It's that very underlying garment. That's the tunic, right? It's just the plain old white. And we're going to see, remember, this whole entire outfit is to make Aaron look unique, glorious, special, divine, holiness to the Lord, bearing the, the nation on his shoulders and before his heart. This is what he's acting out. This is his role. Be this person, Aaron. And you're going to be this, per this person by putting on these clothes, okay? Like I said, Aaron knows. When Aaron goes in before the Lord, He's standing there doing these sacrifices, and he's not being accepted because he's great. He's being accepted because he's wearing these clothes. If he doesn't have the jingling bells, he's going to be judged himself, right? He's going to be a, a man trying to enter into this heavenly repre this representation of heaven, this holy place. And he's going to be judged as a sinful man trying to enter into a holy place, and he'll die. But there's something that's, that's protecting Aaron. And it's the fact that he's putting on somebody else. <laughs> he's saying, I'm going to get into this role. I'm going to put myself into this, whoever this is, whoever holiness to the Lord is, I'm going to put myself in him. And I'm going to waltz into this, this, ta this tabernacle, and I'm going to live. Because God's going to not look and say, hey, Aaron, that's you. He's going to say, that's holiness to the Lord. He's going to say, that's glorious and beautiful. And this is Aaron and it's almost like he's in Christ. And that's what's protecting him from judgment upon himself, is the fact that there's a barrier, there's a mediator. Now for Aaron, it's these garments that declare something about somebody that he is not fulfilling. There's weakness in him and in these things. Uh, but still, he's in somebody. We're in somebody too, same person. <clears throat> All right, verse 40. For Aaron's sons, you shall make tunics, and then you shall make sashes for them. And you shall make, uh, make hats for them for glory and beauty. All right, so again, these are going to be distinct garments, but this is all they're going to get. Uh, Aaron's sons get the tunic, the sash, and the white hat. And they walk around in these white garments, performing their priestly duties, but that's it. They're not going to get an ephod. They're not going to get a breastplate and a shoulder uh, plates or anything like that. That's all they're going to get. So, so you and, uh, uh, where are we here? Uh, so you shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him. You shall anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister to me as priests. And you uh, shall make for them linen trousers, which are pretty much like boxer shorts is what they're going to have, uh, linen trousers to cover their nakedness. They shall reach from the waist to the thighs. Uh, so that'll be underneath everything else. They shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they come into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister uh, in the holy place that they do not incur iniquity uh, and die. It shall be a statute forever to him and his descendants after him. Again, it's not because they are holy, right? God's like, hey, cover up your nakedness, right? I don't want to see your flesh when you're in there and you're not taking this seriously and, you know, everything. You cover you up with these things, these garments. Okay, ready? We're going to zip over now real quick. So now that we have the construction of these garments, we're going to see that there's one time 
when, where these things change for Aaron. Remember, it's anytime he's in the tabernacle, anytime he's ministering, he has to, before he goes in, put on the garments, put on the ephod, put on the robe, put on the hat, put on holiness to the Lord, bear the breastplate. He gets dressed up and then he goes in. And that's how he serves. And when he comes out, he takes them off and he goes back to being regular old Aaron with the people. But when he comes to that, he's not Aaron with the people. He's the high priest. And the same thing with his sons. When they come, you put on your white tunic, your white sash, your white hat. You're a priest of the Lord right now. You're, san- you're forfeit to the sanctuary, right? What it means to be consecrated. Uh, but there is one time where that doesn't take place. Go to Leviticus 16. <clears throat> So this is going to be what's known as the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, things change for Aaron a little bit. So let's read what it says. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, chapter 16, verse 1, after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place, inside the veil, before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. So for those who don't really understand what the tabernacle looked like, picture a rectangular structure. It was like a big, it was a big tent surrounded by a big rectangle made out of wood and fabric, right? So it's kind of like curtains. Inside, you see the tent, the big tent's like a rectangle. You go into a curtain inside the tent and you're standing in a big room. There's a lampstand like a menorah on one side. There's a little table with some sh- uh, bread called the showbread. And then there's a little altar right before another curtain where you go and burn incense. And then behind that last curtain is the smallest room, and it was called the holy place or the holiest of all. In there was the Ark of the Covenant, which had the Ten Commandments, stones inside of it. It'll eventually have Aaron's rod that buds and some of the manna that God provided for the people That was the holiest of all, the place where God's presence would dwell. It represented heaven's throne. And God here is saying, Moses, go tell Aaron. He he never comes in here but whenever he feels like it. This is for something special you come in here. His sons made that mistake. They said, hey, we're going to go praise God. And they went in there and did their own thing. They barged through the curtains, and God killed them immediately. Sinful men have no place in that place. And that's what God's demonstrating. There's a process before you come in here. And we're going to see what some of the process is. Verse 3 says, Thus Aaron, this or in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young burnt, uh, with the of blood of a young bull as a sin offering, and of a ram as a burnt offering. So step one, Aaron's coming in here, he's coming with blood. Now that's how he's going to enter. Step one, he shall put the holy linen tunic, uh, he shall put on the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a a linen sash, and with the linen turban he shall be attired. These are the holy garments. What's missing? The ephod, the breastplate, the shoulder straps. He's only allowed to wear some of his normal outfit. And that's that last picture, Karen, if you could put it up there. Aaron, on the Day of Atonement, he's just wearing the tunic. He's just wearing the white hat. No holiness to the Lord. Just keep this in mind. As we say, this is how God wants him to dress on this special day as he comes into the holiest of all with this blood. You come in looking like this, Aaron. This is what I want you to wear. These are the holy garments. Therefore, uh, he shall wash his body in water and put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and let go... uh, and to, and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bowl of the sin offering, which is for himself, 
and make atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bull as the, as the sin offering, which is for himself. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bowl and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the, on the east side. And before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. So we see this first part of the process is Aaron needs to make a sacrifice for him. Because what's wrong with Aaron? He's a sinner like the rest of us. And he does, like we said before, without the garments on, Aaron is not anything distinct. Aaron doesn't deserve to go into the holiest of all on his own accord. So God says, Aaron, if you're coming in, which you're going to, you're going to bring blood. You're going to bring the blood of a bull. And it's going to be for you, and it's going to be for your sons and your house. And you're going to come. You're going to bring your bull. You're going to kill it. You're going to take its blood. You're going to take some of the coals from the altar where they would cook the sacrifices and burn them. Take some of that and take some incense. And I want you to walk in. You're going to go through the first curtain. The menorah is going to be lighting this dimly lit room. If you can kind of picture, there's no lights, no windows, only candlelight in a pitch black tent. And you're going to come in with this blood. And you're going to put the coals on the altar of incense, this little kind of tall, rectangular altar. And you're going to put the coals there so they're burning. And you're going to take the incense and put it on the coals and wait for it to burn. And it's going to start to smoke. It's going to start to smell. And it was a perfumed incense. So as, as Aaron's standing there, you're going to see just, it's going to be foggy, it's going to be dim, it's going to be cloudy, it's going to have this very unique aroma. So unique, God said that when he told them how to make the incense, that they were never to make it ever again like that. You couldn't say, ooh, I want to sell essence of tabernacle and make it yourself at home and then sell it on the streets. No, it was, it was forbidden anybody else make this recipe. So this was the unique aroma of the tabernacle. It's something special. And as you can picture Aaron walking in with the blood, going through the curtain and seeing the ark, seeing the throne, uh, at least what's represented as God's throne, where his glory is, and it's shrouded in smoke. Does this ring any bells to anybody as you think about maybe some passages of people who've seen what heaven looks like? Isaiah 6 has something to say. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. If you know about the, right, he walks in on top in all the fabric. It's cherubim and seraphim artistically woven into the fabric, right? He says, in the real thing, he says, above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And you see, Isaiah is having this vision where he's seeing the Lord upon the throne, and the whole temple's full of smoke. And you wonder why God's telling Aaron, when you come into this place, I want you to light the fire, make the smoke. It's like it's representative of what heaven's actually like. When the, when the Lord was meeting with Moses, <coughs> excuse me, on Sinai, how did he descend? In a cloud of smoke, right? God constantly tells him, I'm going to meet you in the pillar of smoke, right? This is for God's reasons. This is how he describes himself and how he appeared to men in the Old Testament so often was in this pillar of smoke and fire, uh, and here Aaron's mimicking what it's like as he goes in with the blood. Uh, let's see, where did I leave off here? And he's going to go in, he's going to take the blood, sprinkle it seven times on the side of the mercy seat. And then he's going to go back out after he made atonement for himself, and he's going to uh, do a burnt offering, which was uh, an offering that was fully for the Lord. Nobody got to partake of it. Uh, there's different kinds of offerings. Some, you as the offerer, would be able to eat the meat that came from it. The Lord would get some, burned it uh, in a fire, and it would rise to him in a sense in a sweet smell like a barbecue, and he would enjoy it with you. And you would take some. That's what it was. It was a barbecue. You would take some, and he would, uh, he was the offerer, would have a meal. And it was like having a communion meal with the Lord. Other offerings were not like that. 
the burnt offering was just pure worship to the Lord. You benefit nothing from the burnt offering. It gets completely consumed by the fire. So Aaron goes out after he's now made atonement for himself and his family. He's going to go worship the Lord. And then he's going to deal with the people's sin. Verse 15 says, Then he shall kill the bull, uh, kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. <clears throat> so he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out, that he may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for all the assembly of Israel. And he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. And shall take some of the blood of the bowl and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it, and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting, and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Aaron shall lay, uh, lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat. He shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities uh, to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. Then Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of meeting, shall take off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place, and he'll leave them there. And he shall wash his body with water in a holy place, put on his garments, right? This is the actual high priestly garments, right? The ephod, the hat. He goes in one way, and he's going to come out a different way, right? Uh, he'll come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people, and make atonement for himself and for the people. Uh, the fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar, and he who released the goat as the scapegoat shall, be, uh, shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he's going to come into the camp. Uh, the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp, and they shall burn in their, uh, in their fire the skins, their flesh, uh, and their offal which are the innards, the, uh, the guts. Then he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterwards he may come into the camp. All right, we're almost done. We're going to finish the chapter. This shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. And the priest, who is anointed and consecrated to minister as priest in his father's place, shall make atonement and put on the linen clothes, the holy garments. And then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priests and for the people of the assembly. This shall be an everlasting statute for you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded him. Now, I know we read a whole bunch there. It's the day of atonement. He's going to go in. He's going to make this sacrifice dressed in just his linen, right? just these plain clothes. He's going to look like every other priest, right? all his sons. And you think about what's being represented here. Aaron is told every other day, you're going to wear these glorious clothes, this shiny, beautiful, wonderful garments that, that stand in the place of somebody you're not. Right? It's holiness to the Lord. But on the day that atonement's made, Aaron, I want you to take off your glory. I want you to put it on, put it down. You're not going to come in with your glory on. You're going to look like the other guys. You're going to look like your sons, your brethren. Right? You're going to look like those who are less than you, right? They're not the high priest. You are. But you're going to take off glory, and you're going to look like them. And you're going to come in with this bull's blood, this sacrifice that's going to cleanse sin. And as a regular-looking guy, you're going to stand before the altar of heaven and you're going to atone for the sin of the nation. And then when you come out, Aaron, here's what you're going to do. Pick your glory back up and put it on. 
pick up your beautiful garments and put them back on, and then you stand before the people, and they'll worship the Lord with you because sin's been atoned for, and you're glorious, and they're forgiven. And do you see what God is? He's preaching the gospel here. Right? Aaron, on this day, when the atonement's made, real holiness to the Lord, the real holy one, he's going to take off his glory. Right? Although he was equal with God, he didn't count it robbery. Right? But he made himself of no reputation. He made himself like a bondservant. He came in the likeness of men, humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Right? This is what Jesus did. Took off glory. Came like everybody else bore sin. Now, he didn't use bulls or goats. He used himself. And we see the, the difficulty with animals is if you kill them, you can't do anything else with them. That's why they had to have two goats, right? One was going to be killed and its blood was going to be shed for sin. The other one was going to do this, this function. It was going to be sent out as the scapegoat. Now, scapegoat's an interesting word to study out. It's actually a proper name. It's the name uh, Azazel. And there's, you know, there's argument over what that is. But regardless, this One's going to be for the Lord. That's the one that dies. The other one's going to be for this, this other figure, right? And most people would say he's an evil figure, maybe a demon of the forest that they believed in. Who knows? But either way, you're going to put your hands on that living goat, and it's going to be like all the sins of the nation are going to go on that goat, and you're going to send it off where it came from, into the darkness, into the wilderness, into an uninhabited place. And one goat's blood is going to, going to purchase forgiveness, and the other one's going to carry it away, all the sin. And Jesus did both in himself. His blood bought us our forgiveness, our atonement. But he bore sin himself on the cross. Right? He didn't need two animals. He accomplished it all in himself. His body, which died, that bore sin. It says our sins were put on him. He became a curse for us. And his sin purchased our redemption. And his sin, because he would live again. And he could carry this sacrifice to the true heavenly tabernacle, the true temple where the real mercy seat is, where God dwells, where that sacrifice could be sprinkled and our redemption could be purchased. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus resurrects, Mary sees him and he says, don't cling to me. I haven't yet ascended to my father, right? Like to Mary, don't hold on to me. I still got to go do the thing, you know? So Jesus made the sacrifice once for all for real, not the shadow, the reality. And we see, and we'll close with this, if you turn to Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 8. I was going to read chapter 7, but we'll go with chapter 8. We'll read verses 1 through 6, and then we'll pray. <clears throat> chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. It says, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. And this is the main point of what I'm saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have, uh, have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests, right? There are Aaron's, and there are Aaron's kids who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Jesus is the real and better high priest. What Aaron foreshadowed Jesus is. He is the glorious one. He is holiness of the Lord. He's the barrier between us and wrath. He's what keeps us safe. He's the one we are in. It's all what it's about. All these, you think, what's the big deal with clothes? For Aaron, those clothes were the difference between life and death. Uh, for the Lord, they were a memorial to what he was foreshadowing. And for us, there's something we look back on and say, wow, look what the Lord did for us. He took off glory. He put on humility. Uh, he bore our sins. He carries us on his shoulders, not just the nation of Israel, all those who belong to him. He wears upon his heart. He leads us with light and truth. And I could go on all night with this stuff, but we'll pray. Hopefully you understand and you were blessed. And if not, you can ask me whatever questions you have afterwards. Father, we want to thank you. Thank you, Lord, that in your way, Lord, you use these things, these pictures for us through living uh, people, 
to show us these things you want us to understand. And Lord, I, I ask that you'd help us to see, uh, even if we miss some of it, Lord, maybe there's more there we could analyze, but I pray, Father, you'd help us understand what we did take today, uh, what we did here, what we can understand. I pray you would remind us of how much you care for us, uh, not, Lord, just in putting cool pictures together, but the fact that these things were reality, that in Christ, uh, it's all, it all matters to us. It all means something for us, that he bears us upon his shoulders, and we are upon his heart graven in there, Lord. I thank you for that. I pray, Lord, you'd bless us as we get home. I pray uh, any problems, Lord, that might pop up tonight, you'd remind us uh, of the good things we heard in your presence. I ask that you do it all in Jesus' name. Amen.